I've built a career out of sharing science news and looking into new discoveries. So when I read that it's now possible to edit our genes, the very fabric of what makes us who we are, I was captivated. I've become determined to find out how this genetic revolution could change our lives. Could there be a future where it's as easy as ordering genetic modifications from a menu? Like stronger bones or a disease-free body? And if you could, would you design your DNA? Do the benefits outweigh the risks? I'm off to explore if we should be playing God. Just because we could choose from a mutant menu, does that make gene editing right? Just considering its use, it raises so many tough ethical questions. I want to start a wider conversation, so I've gathered a group of informed citizens to see what they would do. Would you edit your own genes? I would love to get rid of my lactose intolerance. <laughs> I would love that. I'd love to be able to eat ice cream and not worry if I have a lactate. At this point, sure, I'm getting old. My joints are starting to hurt um, in ways that I never thought they would. And if I want to continue to be physically active, I would love to be able to do stuff that allows me to do that. I probably wouldn't. I probably wouldn't. That would be so boring, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'd really like to be a tetrachromat. These are people who could see more colors than the usual people. I would really like that. Yeah, I would definitely do that. No, no, I don't think I would. To me, that's an obvious thing. You know, I think having, just having extra decades of useful, healthy life, we develop our professional skills and, and some small amount of wisdom, and then we're gone but being able to apply that for a little bit longer I think would be powerful. I don't know. I really don't know. Should people be able to do that? I think that the option should be, yeah, should be available. Like if that's, if I don't feel qualified to say, here's what you should do with your own body. If you could choose any aesthetic improvements for yourself, what would they be? Um, well, if I answer that question, that would bring attention to my flaws. <laughs> So removing what we see as flaws with genetic engineering is nothing new. Weeds have become wheat, our tomatoes are sweet and juicy, and even our dogs are hypoallergenic. But it takes generations to refine these beneficial traits. Gene editing allows us to fast track this process by tweaking the DNA of every living thing. And a new breakthrough technology called CRISPR-Cas9, or CRISPR for short, promises to do this more cheaply and accurately than ever before. So what is CRISPR? CRISPR-Cas9, which stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, is a new gene editing tool that allows us to tweak DNA in all living things. CRISPR was discovered in bacteria as a way they identify and destroy invading viruses. And to edit DNA, scientists have now repurposed what's like a tiny programmable molecular scalpel to cut at precise locations in the genetic code. And then DNA is provided and pasted in to repair that cut. And just like that, mozzie, fish or your DNA has been edited. And since this technology has global implications, I'm travelling around the world meeting experts to find out what these implications might be. Are we in the DNA revolution? Yeah, I'm pretty sure, yeah. Will, will CRISPR change everything? Definitely CRISPR will change our lives. We're here to meet Jin Soo Kim. He's a gene editing pioneer and he's using this CRISPR technique to try and save the banana and also to develop super muscular pigs. It could solve a food supply problem, but it seems kind of weird. I don't know if I want to eat that pork and I really like pork buns. I'm interested to know if you're using CRISPR to save the banana. Mm -hmm. The banana is on the verge of extinction because of uh, fungal disease. Uh, all the banana is genetically identical, you know, Cavendish bananas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the single uh, pathogen can kill every banana on Earth. And then now we try to make banana uh, that, are, that is resistant to the fungus. So we can just change 
one gene at a time. There are some candidate genes, and then fungus cannot uh, infect. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. So it's uh, like a surgery, mm -hmm. right? If you have uh, some defective gene with fatal, uh, you know, the phenotype, then you can now use uh, CRISPRs to correct the defect. And CRISPR is being used to enhance our food as well as correct defects. With an ever-increasing population, especially in Asia, scientists are getting creative about bulking up what we eat. We create a super muscle peak by just uh, mutating a single gene uh, called the myostatin. So myostatin actually inhibits uh, muscle growth and differentiation. So we knock out the uh, myostatin gene and then the pigs have a super you know, muscle. So, so like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but in a pig. Exactly. You know, the pig will produce, will provide the lean meat with a high protein content and low fat content. And it could be a healthy diet for many people. So CRISPR is making the genetic engineering of everything faster, cheaper and more accurate. Its potential is enormous and in some places it's becoming a reality. So uh, the difference is, you know, uh, whether nature makes it or scientists makes it. Mm -hmm. Nature can make it, but uh, randomly. So if you just screen one million individuals and there is uh, one variant, one mutant with a supermotor phenotype. So to find it, you know, it, it'll take a lot of time and resource. Mm -hmm. But with this tool, CRISPR-Cas9 or, or other genome editing tools, now you can do it uh, in one or two years. However you feel about the Schwarzenegger pigs, they're just one way we can hack evolution for our benefit. More gene editing pioneers are pushing the boundaries of the revolution, using CRISPR to create, well, just about anything. We're off to Harvard Medical School to speak with George Church about the wild possibilities of gene editing, like de-extinction of species. If anyone's going to push further in the field, it's him. We're definitely in a DNA revolution of both reading and writing genomes, and it's much, much bigger than editing. Editing is bigger than CRISPR, and, and gene therapy is bigger than editing, and the revolution is much bigger than any of those. Professor Church published one of the first methods for mapping our genome. He more or less invented modern DNA sequencing. Why is everyone so excited about CRISPR? Yeah, you know, even though my team was one of the inventing teams, uh, I'm mystified uh, as to why people are so <laughs> excited about it. I think it has a cool name, has uh, some cool personalities involved, uh, and some cool projects that, that were enabled by a whole revolution in reading and writing genomes in general. Not just editing, but writing. And I think it's just a little more efficient. And the Church Lab is using CRISPR to try and solve some of medicine's biggest problems. Tell me about the, the pig organs that you were humanizing. So one of the health crises in the world has, has, all, has been ever since transplantation worked is there's not enough donors. So a solution is to either grow the organs in the lab, which is potentially expensive, uh, or to grow them in an animal that's well matched. It turns out the pig, this was recognized three decades ago, has almost perfectly sized organs, and there have been some transplants that, that worked in, uh, in uh, primates for short periods of time. But they need, to be, they need to be crafted so that their composition is compatible with the human recipient. So you're using genetic engineering to humanize these That's organs right. so people won't reject them. It's something that would have been very difficult a few years ago, but with CRISPR and other parts of the revolution, we can, uh, we can now make tens of changes, hundreds of changes as, as needed uh, to make uh, a pig that's very, that could, that could be long-term compatible with less and less immune suppression needed. And never before have you been able to avoid immune suppression by engineering the, the donor. And finally, and it's still hard to engineer a human donor, mm -hmm. but it's, so it, ironically, the pig could end up being a better donor <laughs> than a human because you can engineer it. As well as growing organs in pigs for human donation, Church is working towards making animals like the woolly mammoth de extinct, editing mammoth genes into the Asian elephant so they can again roam the tundra, stomping the insulating snow and keeping greenhouse gases locked up in the frozen soil. Could CRISPR give us unicorns? So, yeah, we're getting creative now. Um, so there are examples of uh, 
animals that have single horns in the middle, so like the rhinoceros has one at its nose, but there are other ancient rhinoceros that have it in the middle of the head. So anyway, I think that you could uh, get a single horn on a horse uh, by looking at uh, horns and other species. Uh. So it's in the realm of possibility. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think that sounds cool. I, I dabble in science fiction. <laughs> but, but a lot of science fiction is now becoming science fact. I mean, the things that, that really seemed uh, either unimaginable to the unimaginative uh, is now routine. And they forgot that, that, that it used to be unimaginable. Do you think we'll get to a point where CRISPR is in vogue and people want to edit their genes? Well, it's already in vogue in a certain sense. Uh, it's in vogue in the media, in but the media. Would, it, would it be? Well, it's in, in television shows and so forth. But yeah, in terms of in vogue, if you would do it. Well, so I, I know of two people who have already done uh, gene therapies on themselves without, you know, not, without going through the usual channels. Will CRISPR change everything? I think the genetic revolution, including CRISPR, will change everything. So in this genetic revolution, who decides if we should be editing our DNA? From lawyers to scientists, we're not really sure. Regulations haven't caught up with reality. A few months ago, I saw a press release from a Swedish plant scientist who had grown and eaten vegetables edited with the CRISPR technique, just because he could. Hi, Hi Stefan. <laughs> or rather, he could in Sweden. Elsewhere in Europe, it would require government approval. Stefan Jansson drew attention to the oddities of the current laws with his CRISPR edited vegetables. I'm very excited to see your CRISPR vegetables. What have you brought for us? Hmm? Yeah, got it down there. You yeah, let's see, see let's see. I want to see. <laughs> and here is some. <laughs> I actually got it from. In the university yesterday, and then I was okay, washing wow. it at home. Okay, so. wow! Excellent. <laughs> they are not really big. Okay, I mean they look beautiful to me. Yeah. Stefan has gone to great lengths to grow this cabbage. I'm planning on becoming one of the first people to eat CRISPR edited vegetables. I mean, okay. how are they? How are they? How are they different to a normal vegetable? The only thing that they are different, they are lacking a little piece. of one gene. I believe that you smuggled these seeds into Sweden from another country in well, Europe. Well, yeah, yeah, yes, or <laughs> smuggle, smuggle. I, I got them from other country in Europe, yes. <laughs> okay, yes. but why, why couldn't these be grown outside of Sweden? Because Sweden is the only country in Europe that have taken a the decision or made their own interpretation of the European law about genetically modified plants. They said, well, if, if you only do it in this way, if you only take some DNA away, if you don't add anything, then according to their interpretation, this is not a GMO. Because if you don't add anything, it also means that you can't detect it. So do you think that this is genetically modified? Well, that's, what, is it, what is genetically modified? That's the, that's the problem. <laughs> if genetically modified is something which has different genes and different genetic combinations for what's their nature, then of course everything we eat is genetically modified because we've done plant breeding for uh, millennia. Mm -hmm. and we have very significantly changed the gene pools of everything, everything we eat. I mean, whatever we, even if we look at potatoes here, that's an, anything is very different from the natural counterparts. Well, I'll, I'll make sure that I don't eat too much of this. Well, I, I mean, well, I said <laughs> we have we, some reindeer and all Yeah, there. luckily we have some yeah. other things to go with it. So, uh, look, I bought you some reindeer. Yeah. Uh, it is a reindeer heart because I thought that's probably the most Swedish thing ever mm, that we could yeah. have got. Mm. Okay, so we have a reindeer heart okay. and we have some horseradish to go with that. Yeah. We have yeah. some potatoes yeah. as well. Crispy, crispy cabbage. Let's there we go. Enough. Sounds pretty amazing. Exactly. This is num <laughs> meal number five. <laughs> meal number crispy meal number five. Yeah, in the world. In the world. Okay. I, th so I it's, think it's somewhat a historic event. Yeah. And the only that is being cooked internationally. So I'm the first international guest to eat your crispy food. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, I feel like that's a historic event. So how do you how do you say bon appetit in Swedish? Uh, var så god. Var så god. Var så god. Var så god. Is that, <laughs> my Swedish oh, is very okay. bad. <laughs> Dig in. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, after you. So I'm about to put 
crisper, modified food in my body. Let's see how this goes. Okay. Just tastes like normal cabbage. Hmm. CRISPR could lead to the unimaginable. Stefan publicised his CRISPR cabbage to highlight the gap between what science can do and what we think we ought to do. Do you think we're playing God or manipulating nature by genetically modifying things like plants and seeds? Well, no. I mean, first of all, we're part of nature. So uh, we're constantly being manipulated by our natural environment and we're manipulating back. Uh, that's, there's nothing sort of godlike about that. The benefits are also potentially massive. I mean, you know, feeding the world, uh, curing all congenital diseases. Um, so playing God in a good way. I think that's one of those things which is a very polarising use of words. It's not suddenly we have this one technology which suddenly is the God technology. I think as an evolution over time, like humans build on knowledge and build on technologies. How is it different when we manipulate plants over manipulating humans? So I think for humans, because we do, whilst biologically, we're the same as any other creature. But same as any other animal, we're all made from the same stuff. But we give ourselves special, these rules that apply to humans that don't apply to anyone else. We generally recognise that there's something special about us humans. And so I think that because we have these ethical rules, if we were genetically modifying humans, we would start to come up against those rules. Who gets the right to choose whether we edit our genes or not? Mm. <laughs> um... Yeah, um, I mean, I would, I would always start with personal. So I think it should be, I think it should be personal. It should be you. It should be for you, through you, and me for me. It's all of us, and when I mean that, that's all of us. And the problem is that it can't just be scientists who work on the technology, and it can't just be politicians in a corner, you know, deciding, and it can't just be the public. I think all of those people have to get together. In order to be cautiously optimistic, we have to. Um really think about what we're doing and not shy away from it because we're scared of crazy mutants happening, uh, but like tackle the problem head on and really be honest about what we can and can't do and what we should or shouldn't do. As long as we know what we're doing and not just dive in without checking for unforeseen consequences of doing that. The thing is, we don't know all of the unforeseen consequences. Would you risk your health or your child's health to potentially benefit from gene editing? how deep we dive becomes a big ethical consideration. I'm on my way to Melbourne to talk to bioethicist Rachel Ankeny about ethics and the genetic revolution. I see myself not as necessarily telling people what to do, but helping people think through the implications of decisions they might make. So you're a professional thought provoker? I hope so, yeah. Professional thought provoker. Concept and clarifier, right? Hard question asker, concept clarifier, and Correct. advice giver. Exactly. What do you see as the range of ethical questions that I should be asking people? Modifying the genome as such isn't in itself, I think for most people, a major ethical issue. It's the purposes for which it's going to be deployed, who's going to benefit, um, what kind of safeguards are in place to make sure that it's safe and effective before it actually is used, either in an external setting, in the case of agriculture or pests, or if you're thinking you know, as an individual, the kinds of things, if you had a child who had a condition or you knew you were at risk to pass on something, would be, you know, is the risk of those kind of unanticipated consequences worth the potential benefit. Is there a place where you will say th this is a good spot for the benefit to outweigh, outweigh the risk? People are generally much more open if it's a biomedical kind of intervention, um, if it's something that's going to cure a disease that's, that's quite severe. Um, people are willing to take a little more risk um, because the benefit is so great. If it's a kind of intervention that simply is going to create more profit, they're much less interested because they don't see what the benefit is. Who decides how much risk we take? Often companies hold the rights to technologies like CRISPR, so it's their moral compass which can set the boundaries. I first heard about CRISPR actually taking a test my first year of graduate school, so I was really lucky to be in the early wave of people who were starting to jump into the field. I think the impact that it will have on both healthcare and food 
is fundamental. We're in Silicon Valley, where there's a growing number of biotech startups hoping to commercialize technologies just like CRISPR. One of them is Caribou Biosciences, which was born out of one of the labs where the CRISPR technique was developed. What's the role of a startup in terms of looking for novel solutions to a problem or just trying to make money for the initial investors? Right. For us, obviously, we're a company and, and we have obligations to our investors and to our shareholders. Um, but we're also very ethically driven by how and where this technology should be used. Obviously, there are a lot of conversations around some of the potential uses for editing the human germline, for example. And we feel very strongly that that's an inappropriate use of the technology. So you don't think we should edit the human germline? We don't. Why, why is that? If you're starting with a human embryo, a single cell that's going to turn into every cell in that person's body, any mistakes get propagated across the entire body. And we simply don't know enough yet to feel that that would be safe or, or fair to that person to treat their, their very first cell in that way. The human germline is the DNA you pass on to your children. It's not affected by gene therapy, but if we do choose to edit eggs, sperm, or a single fertilized cell, we'll not only alter the resulting baby, but the DNA of every one of their descendants, forever and ever. And if that's not enough to give you pause, it's also a real challenge. It's not one gene, one outcome. It's tens, hundreds of genes that all work together to make you as tall or short as you are, or your hair color, or your eye color, or your intelligence. And so it's, it's not as simple as one tiny change, and it has a very significant or specific impact on someone. What is the social cost of something like genetic engineering? Could it lead to more inequality? It's a great question. I mean, I think it's a fundamental question that comes with all drugs. Um, the cost of drugs, obviously, is something that's talked about extensively in the United States right now. Um, I think one of the arguments that's uh, frequently put forward by the, the drug development world is the cost it actually takes to get these new drugs to market. And so you, you have that compared against sort of the, the social desire to help cure all of these patients uh, or treat all of these patients regardless of their socioeconomic status. I think it's a fundamental challenge for medicine. Will it create more inequality? Absolutely. It absolutely could. And I think that's why we have to be, be very specific and careful and pointed about like how we're doing research and who's funding it and how that actually gets availed to the public. So it's not just like a super class of people that are really rich being able to modify themselves for their own benefit. It is definitely a fear that I have. I don't know that I can say that it definitely will, but it is a thing that strikes me as, as a possibility. In most medical research, it's mostly based on the majority population. And so what if minority groups are sort of left behind? Concerns about accessibility to the genetic revolution are real. But can we really ignore a way to cure disease for so many people? There is benefit to having a genome that is mutable, because without it, we wouldn't be here. So we know evolution. So we're all mutants, in a way. We, we are. There is no normal. Dr. Edelman runs a genetic testing program for prospective parents at Mount Sinai Hospital. It's a way we currently screen for genetic disease to minimize the chance of passing it on to our children. There are roughly 4,000 genes in the, in the human genome that um, have, a, a, have some connection or association to disease. In a genetic test, in particular a carrier screen, we're um, assessing a person's uh, risk of having a child born with a genetic disorder. So we're testing their, their DNA, their genome, and looking for um, mutations that would cause disease. I'm imagining that you have a room that's just full of people's spit here. <laughs> yes. Is that and this is the room, yeah. <laughs> this is the extraction room. A lot of the hype with CRISPR has been around editing human genes, and not everyone thinks we should do that. But the reality is gene editing can help those with diseases. Do you think that carrier screening is a more effective way to control genetic diseases than using CRISPR would be? At the moment, yes. There are very few genetic diseases with cures. At the moment, CRISPR really isn't being used to um, cure many genetic diseases. But it is imaginable. 
CRISPR is being used to treat patients with cancer, and trials using CRISPR to correct genetic disorders can't be far off. Do you think we'll get to a point where genetic engineering is widely accepted, where we could use CRISPR in people? I think that if it's going to cure a disease, I can't imagine why it wouldn't be widely accepted. When a lot of people talk about CRISPR in the media, they also talk about designer babies. Do you think it's realistic that something like CRISPR could be used to design a baby? So, I think for designer babies, we need to understand a lot more about the genome than we do. And, uh, you know, I don't consider carrier screening designer baby because you're, you're really trying to avoid genetic disorder in your, in, in your offspring. But as far as eye color, you know, athletic ability, all of those things, I think that's something for the future. We'll see where society goes with that. If you were having a child mm -hmm. and you could pick out diseases from them, like if you could design your child's genes and you could say, I don't want my child to have all of these diseases, what yes. would you choose? Um, but I think that's really, that's a hard question. I'm so glad you asked the question that way because, you know, as a psychologist, like our minds are so different when we're talking in the abstract versus my kids, right? We suddenly become totally selfish when it comes to my kids. And in general, I can be like, bad idea. Like we don't want the whole world living long. I want my kids living long. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't want them to be sick. If I knew that my child was at high risk for sp specific diseases, then I probably would want to do that. I mean, yes, I would take them out if I knew they were there. I've actually chosen not to have children, but a, a part of my decision is the self-knowledge uh, that I wouldn't, I don't think I have what it takes to take care of a child who would need care for life because they were disabled in some way. And that's something that can happen. And, and if there was a way with genetic editing to know for sure that that wasn't going to be um, a problem, a concern, then maybe that would change my decision. A child born with that genetic disease doesn't have exactly the same quality of life as others. Uh, in that case, I think if we can fix it, why not? That, that's the ultimate cure. Then the question becomes, how far do we go? Um, eliminating diabetes, eliminating obesity, but what about autism? And what about ADHD? Curing genetic disease in humans is about removing unwanted mutations. But how far do we go? We might all want to use CRISPR as a fast, cheap way of turning ourselves into superhumans. We've discovered genetic superhumans who accumulate less cholesterol. Others are almost diabetes proof, and some have stronger bones. They're all due to these beneficial mutations that you, one day, might want to edit into your genes. But this is still reliant on us knowing where to edit our DNA. Finding people with good mutations can show us exactly where those beneficial genes are. That's a good question. There are problems. We're in a medical research institute at a hospital. Normally we would talk about sickness and disease, right? But you're a guy who's all about wellness. It's so loud in here. Yes, this wow. is uh, what a supercomputer sounds like. <laughs> we believe that medical research has missed a large segment of really important people mm -hmm. that we feel like are really interesting to study. And those are people who should be sick, but somehow they've escaped. Here at Mount Sinai, there's also a resilience project. It's looking for healthy genetic mutations that people carry that protect us against disease. And so to find them, the first thing that we can do is go out and just ask people about whether or not they believe they might match some pattern of resilience. The other way that we can go is if somebody doesn't have any evidence that they're resilient per se, mm -hmm. um, that we can maybe start with their genome and mm -hmm. look in their genome for severe risk factors for disease and then zoom up to the person and see if they lack typical signs and symptoms of that disease. To find genetic superhumans, this supercomputer churns through healthy people's DNA to find genetic mutations that protect them against disease. When you identify these genetic superpowers or these yeah. beneficial mutations, yeah. do you think it's possible that someone like me could get those edited into my genome? Well, I suppose. I think, I think um, 
I sort of depends on what time scale that you're, you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think that there are a lot of different ways that this information could ultimately be turned into new medicines. Right. And I think like, you know, editing humans is, 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 is something, or editing their DNA is something, there's a lot of work to do yet around figuring out whether or not it's safe and in what areas that it can actually have, you know, good effects for people. If genetic superpowers are a long way off, what can you do right now to drive the genetic revolution? Speeding things up may lie in more democratised science. Think DIY and out of a garage, like the humble beginnings of Apple, Facebook or Uber, but for your genome. So it started when I worked at NASA. Uh, I was a scientist at NASA in their synthetic biology program, and I thought, what happens if people at home can start to contribute to science? And what technology would really get people excited to start to do genetic design in their home? And I thought, wow, it's probably CRISPR. Allow me. So far, we've been to labs and universities and hospitals around the world where you might expect to find cutting edge science. Here in the Bay Area, we're visiting a biohacker in his garage. He's selling CRISPR kits, DIY CRISPR kits for a couple of hundred dollars. But one of the big questions is how do you create something that's tangible using like genetic design that people can use? So we thought, well, what is you know, something that we use or do often that uses some sort of organism that we can engineer. And the obvious thing is fermentation, like making alcohol. What's so special about the yeast that you have engineered? So, oh, so the yeast that we use, it's just a normal brewing yeast that you could buy from any company online anywhere. The cool thing that our kit allows people to do, and it's our first kit of many, this makes the yeast glow. So what you're gonna look for is you're gonna see a glow on there. Huh. Is this harmful to me? The yeast? Yeah. Oh, no, I mean, you use like, yeast no, to Like, the, no, the, the green fluorescent protein. Oh, no, not at all. It's not that the bacteria in, or anything in any of our kits is hazardous or could cause harm. It, everything in it is completely non-hazardous, cannot cause harm at all. When you think about, like, the computer revolution and how that changed everything, it wasn't until that they came into homes and people personally had them that the computer revolution like exploded. So I think investing in consumers is kind of what spurs everything. You can buy this cutting edge kit that allows you to use this technology and you don't need anything else. You don't need a PhD and you could do experiments with CRISPR like, that I think is, is really cool and it shows the direction that the world is like going in genetic technology, genetic design. <laughs> Should we try some? Sure, we can try some. Cheers. Mm. And there's always a chance that there's going to be a renegade scientist or renegade person editing the genetic code, um, but you know, as a species, I think we've got to really be informed and educated so that we can make good decisions. What happens when you start experimenting with our genes and we might create these um, aesthetic differences? Uh, will these humans be seen as different than humans who don't have those modifications? Could that lead to eugenics? Could that lead to new divides in humanity? I don't know, that stuff is, that stuff's scary. I think that when you're talking about um, genetic modifications like that to yourself, you have to accept that almost nothing is risk or cost free and there's always a trade off and you have to think ahead. And most of us don't really think ahead. It's really hard to plan even for next year. We've been playing God with our, our health. Um, from transplanting organs and a lot of the fears that people had with that. What are we doing over here? And we sort of get used to it. And I think that's that's one of the things here about, about all of this is there's a lot of outcry and a lot of concern and a lot of fear and then we sort of get used to it. We habituate to it. And I think a very similar thing is going to happen with uh, altering genomes of humans. So editing our DNA is technically possible, but it's unwise and untested. 
Clinical trials using CRISPR are happening right now. As knowledge grows and risk declines, the extraordinary becomes commonplace. We are undeniably in the middle of a genetic revolution. The technology to change us is already here. And, well, you need to decide how the rest of the revolution plays out. If we know right now what we want to improve, repair or preserve, having a conversation about editing our DNA nudges our future in a better direction. We're in the process of improving, testing and retesting these technologies until the line between science fiction and science fact will no longer be a question of scientific limit, but a matter of choice. Would you like to place an order?